use it in a mighty way. Father, that we could just come to a place where that we could just enter into your presence. Father, we do thank you for that and the blessings that we have through it. And Father, I just pray now that the Holy Spirit would do a work. Father, we could just turn this service over to him and allow him to teach us this morning. Father, I know that it's nothing that I say that matters. It's only what we have through the Spirit that counts. So we pray that he would work in a mighty way in each heart and life. Father, that we would use this message just to draw near to you. That's our sole desire. We praise you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, we look at life today, and as we've already mentioned, there's so much evil in the world. You know, it doesn't take long to see that, because if you begin to look around, evil abounds everywhere we look. You know, whether we like it or not, that's the reality of the life we live. You know, we can turn on a TV show and see the ugliness of the world in it. You know, from all the things that we look at as entertainment. You know, and that's a scary thing when you really think about it. But yet at the same time, we go to movies that we shouldn't be seeing, but yet we go. And that's sad. You know, we ought to have more convictions and deeper convictions and they're coming into that place. But I look at these kids today with the video games. You know, you got all the blood and the gore and, and the more that's in there, the more it's sold and the bigger it's po- the more popular it is. You know, and to me, that that's sad. I remember when my kids were growing up and my youngest son, he was really into video games. But they still, I wouldn't allow them to have games like that. You know, and, and it, it's sad when we see this because I think it influences kids in a great way, the same way with music today. You look at some of this music today, it's pathetic. I mean, it is really pathetic. You know, and when you look at the whole industry, it's just in a sad state. But, you know, we look at that as, as the news even. You know, to me, that creates as much problem as anything else. You know, you look at some of these school shootings that kids are going through, and it's fed off of other reports, and uh, it influences them whether they want to think it does or not. It does because it affects the, the mind. It puts that influence right into that place. You know, so when we see these things, they they look at something that is bad as good. They look at it as, as popular or behavior that's acceptable. But it's not. It is not at all. And it's not something that any Christian should be imitating. I can really get off here real fast because this is something that just drives me absolutely crazy. You look at the Christian music today, it's, it's pathetic. It is pathetic. You can't even listen to a radio, Christian radio station anymore. I listened to one the other day because I didn't, if I don't go very far, I don't turn my phone on. But I would just turn the radio on because I was just going to Walmart and back. And I'm listening to this, and I'm thinking, what are you even saying? You know, I mean, it, it doesn't even make sense. You know, and, it, and it's sad, you know, when you begin to see these things. But yet we live in a day where we think that this type of thinking is right, and it should not be that way. It, it shouldn't be this way at all because it's not the norm. It's not the norm to imitate the world as a Christian. You know, and I think that if in Christ, if we don't make a stand soon, we're not going to have a stand to make, you know, and that's what we got to be careful of. And I, I look at this and I get excited when I see verses like this. In Isaiah 5.20, it says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's a very important verse for us today because this is something we're seeing going on all around us. It's something that's taking place in such a, a widespread way that you wonder if it'll ever get back to where it was. And i got to believe that unless the Lord really does a mighty work through his spirit, it won't get to that place. And I think that's why as Christians we need to be praying. We need to be seeking that in a warfare-style prayer, not just some little prayer that we go into our prayer closet and say, oh, Jesus, help them, bless them, call it good. That's not it. I read a book by Samuel Howell, I think was his name. He was a preacher, but he was a real prayer intercessor. And it was back during World War II. And the Lord would make this man up in the middle of the night because there was a battle going on somewhere and that God would wake him up in the middle of the night to pray for that battle for those soldiers. And it was an amazing thing to read the testimony that he had. But this is a man that was going to warfare prayer. And it was a man that stood within that. But this is not the norm to call evil good. 
It's not the norm at all for us. I like what Isaiah says. He says, woe unto them. Now, if you really get into this word woe, it's interesting because this is a deep-seated sorrow that Isaiah has right here. It's a sorrow for his people. It's a sorrow for those that's living in this way. And it's interesting. We think it's all of our day. No, it was in his day as well. They face the same thing we're facing. But what we realize is he's trying to tell them that judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And you better be ready. You better be ready. You want to keep calling evil good? Then you better get ready. It's interesting if you look at that word woe, because that word woe means basically the opposite of blessed. It's the opposite of blessed. It really is the, the basic meaning of it. So this means to me, if we're walking in this way, and thinking that good is, is evil is good, be ready for the judgment. That's all he can say. Be ready for the judgment. Why is this such a harsh, harsh statement? And that's the thing we got to see. It was a very hard statement that he gave. But judgment is going to be to the face of the individual that walks that way. I don't think we can preach a harder message than that. I don't think we should preach anything less than that. You know, we live in a day where all we want to hear is, is good things. I looked at a thing this morning. It popped up on uh, a news feed. On, I was looking at the news this morning. And they had the, the 10 highest, the 10 richest preachers in the world. So I thought, oh, I got to see this. You know, so, so I went through it and seen it. That one preacher is worth over a billion dollars. A billion three. A billion three. Kenneth Copeland. $750 million, and he begs for more money. Come on. I'd hate to be that man when he stands at the judgment seat, personally. That'd scare me to death. I wouldn't want that kind of money. I mean, look at the good he could do with that, you know, instead of begging for more money. And the list went on and on and on. But the thing that, to me, is, is so sad is that these person, these people live that way. You know, why aren't we helping others? Why are we doing that to prepare and uh, promote the gospel? You know, and, and, it, and it, I, I, I need to get off my hobby horse now, don't I? I? I really do. I really do. But I want you to think about this in a great way because I think that in the day we live in, it's important. I think that, that Job stated this well. Now, with the person that wants to, to call evil good better be careful right here because here we see the judgment that Isaiah is talking about. Job 18, 16. His roots shall be dried up beneath. Above shall his branches be cut off. Now, most of us are going to read by that and not have a lick of knowledge of what Job's talking about. But when we look at this, this is a very important thing because both himself and his posterity is going to be took, took away. Him and his riches. God's going to judge them, and they will be taken away. Another thing we see here is this way this lays out. His roots shall be dried up and beneath. That's him. Now, the branches are his family, his children. It's reaching in that far into this person's life. If you want to call that that, that's good. Now I remember where I was going earlier with what I was going to say. You know who hit that high list was Joel Olstein. Joel Olstein. Now the only reason I bring this back up is for this. We are told to preach the gospel. We are told to preach all the gospel, not just good feelings. Good feelings. I could pack this church, do it easily. All I have to do is chuck the Bible and start preaching, hey, you're good, you're good, you're good, I'm good, we're all good. We're all good. We're all going to heaven. Everything's a happy, happy day. I could do, now I couldn't do that. I could not do that. But this is what I'm saying. Why is it that sells and this don't? Because people don't want to face that. They don't want to hear the reality of that. I've said this before, and I mean this with all my heart. I would rather have a church of 20, 30 people that preach the gospel, know what the Bible says, and know that they're right with God. I would rather have that than thousands of people sitting before me that one day I'll stand in judgment for because I didn't teach them what the Bible said. Now, that may be harsh, but that's reality. That's what that means right there. And when we can look at that and understand the excitement of it and the importance of it, what a difference it makes. How that makes all the difference in the world. This right here is where it gets dangerous. Because when we look at this, this type of thinking will destroy us if we think everything's, everything's good, evil is good, 
And you see that everywhere you go. <sighs> Man, I could really get off here. Oh, I could really get off here. Because there's some things that really just get in my craw. But, but where Christians are today, I think, is a very scary thing. Because we've lost our convictions. We don't even know what that means anymore. We don't know what it means to walk in the true holiness of what this teaches. Now, everybody may say that's not right, but it is right. It is right. Because if we was holding to the convictions that this says, there's a lot of things that we wouldn't be doing. We wouldn't be doing them. Because we would understand that the Bible says, have no part with Belial. If I'm not to have no part with the devil, then I better get in this book to see the difference between this part and this part. That's the, that's the difference. And when we can see that, it does matter how I live. God says, be ye holy for what? I am holy. We have to come to that place. Because if not, what this is saying right here is that that person is going to face utter destruction. Utter destruction. The judgment will be severe. That's what it's saying. That's what it means. But note the blessings here, because this is what I like. God always tells us this side, but he also tells us this side. And as Christian people, this is what we can grab a hold of. I want you to note the blessing here that Paul gives in Romans 5.20. Now break this down when we're done. Moreover, the law entered, and the offense might, uh, that, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now understand this. What he's saying is, moreover, the law entered. What was the purpose of the law? In order to understand what Paul was saying, we need to understand what he meant. Paul said he did not know sin outside of the law. So the law pointed us to sin. If I read the Old Testament, I see all the things that God calls bad, evil, wicked. I see that in the law. Don't do this, 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 don't do this. He's pointing all of that out. So this is what Paul's saying. Paul said, if I didn't have the law, I wouldn't know I sinned. But because of the law, I know I sinned. But in the midst of all of that, what, what did he say? But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. How could we ever understand the, the grace of God if we didn't understand the law? We didn't understand sin or what all that meant. God's grace will shine through. And when it shines through, it'll create within us a hunger. And it'll create within us a thirst. Grace will abound over the evils of the world. Don't miss that. We may look at this world and think, ah, oh, this thing's just going to hell everywhere you look. And it is. But grace still abounds. Grace still abounds. And to me, that's so exciting. If that is the case, let's ask ourselves this question. How do we walk above the evil of this world? This is the key. This is it. This is what we have to see. And it's not say, patting yourself on the back and patting you on the head and say, it's going to be good, it's going to be okay. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is this. This is where the fruit of the Spirit comes in. Y'all know where we're going because we're in the series. But note again this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. I love that. I love that. Now, a lot of people have the wrong idea what that means. Because they just take it for face value, goodness. Many want to tie it with kindness that we've seen last week. The key here to walking above the evil of the world is goodness. Now, when we understand goodness, many want to marry it with kindness, as I said a minute ago. But the thing of it is, there is a big difference between these two. And we need to see the importance of this truth. Because if we don't understand the difference, we're not going to grab a hold of this. We have to understand how these two work. Goodness means a moral, a moral righteousness, upright. That's what it means. That means I'm walking in goodness. I'm walking morally upright. So when we look at this and we see it the way that God wants it to be, we have a choice. We are either going to follow goodness, walking in the moral uprightness, or we're going to walk in unrighteousness. There are only two choices. There's no middle ground here. Because if I'm not walking upright, then I'm slumped over, headed down. So we look at that in that way and see the importance of walking here. Now, we do see a difference in this, and this is what I want you to see. Notice the difference, and follow me here now. Goodness is Jesus cleansing the temple and rebuking the Pharisees. That's just not what we would call goodness, but that's what it is. 
because Jesus was doing a moral act. He was cleansing the temple. Now get this. As Christian people, where is the temple? It's right here. That means I need to cleanse this temple. I need to walk in holiness. I need to walk in purity. Why? Because this is the temple of God. Jesus took the temple and cleansed it that day with a whip. We, most of us say, oh, that's not very good. That was very good. Because that was filth in the temple. It was filth before God. And we must come to a place where we eliminate that in our lives. Now watch the difference from kindness in Jesus. Kindness is Jesus reaching out to the woman at the well and to all the little children. He showed them kindness. I mean, he could have whacked that lady at the well, married all these times, and now she's living with a man she's not even married to. He could have just annihilated her, but he didn't. He softly led her to himself and told her who he was. And he suffered all the little children to come into him. That would have been a precious moment, I think, right there. When all the apostles are saying, get away, get away, get away. And Jesus stopped them all and said, bring them in. Bring them in. What an illustration of what he does with us as little children. He brings us in as his little children. And he heals us and he protects us and he keeps us. But goodness doesn't also mean something else. It means a virtue, a virtue of righteousness. And that's the big one. It's virtue. If you don't get any else, get that. It's virtue. I'm walking in virtue. And that's what this goodness is. The Spirit is the one that leads us into that. It's not something you're going to try to do on your own because you're going to fail. It's a fruit of the Spirit. We allow that virtue to build. Paul said it this way. Now, you're going to have to stay with me here because we're going to look at some Greek words. In Ephesians 5, 9, it says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all. And pay attention to that word all. All goodness, all righteousness, and all truth. There's a key word there because it leads us to where we realize that that virtue is part of our Christian character. And that's what this goodness is doing. It's building within us a character. I like this. The whole thing of the fruit of the spirits is to build a character within us. The first three are to make us closer to God. The second three are to make us closer to people, how we operate in the world, how people see us. Because when they see us, they should see the first three. They should see the Father. Impressive. These are all so impressive to me. This is where virtue of goodness takes center stage in our lives. Because our virtue is going to be what people see. Because it'll be a harvest of walking in a character that imitates God. And that is the way we are all to walk. We are to walk as imagers of Christ. Imagers of the Father. And if I'm imitating Him, I'm going to walk in that goodness. I'm going to walk in righteousness. I'm going to walk in truth. All this because of what the Spirit does for us in our lives. We're going to see it in our lives, and then others will see it in our lives. And I don't care what anybody says, people at some point will be drawn to that. And if you don't believe this, if you're living a Christian walk, and you're being honorable to the Father, and you work with people that are ungodly people, and they make fun of you being in Christ, the day's coming where they will face something in their life that they can't handle, and they're going to come to you. Hey, man, will you pray for me? Well, of course I will. Man, I've been bad to you. It's all right. Let's pray. Don't make them wait. Pray right there with them. Humble them. And most of them, you'll find out, they'll stand right there and pray with you. They won't say a word, but they'll let you pray for them. That, to me, is an amazing thing. I'm going to get too far off track here. We've got a long way to go. When I was working, it was an amazing thing. And I don't know how this ever happened. But when I was working construction, I mean, we'd go to jobs. They'd only put me on jobs that last about six weeks because I'd go crazy if I was on a job for over six weeks. So they moved me a lot. So, so I went to this job, and most of the time I was the foreman on the job, and I walked in there, and they handed me the drawings. I was walking around with the supervisor, and we were looking this job over, and he, these people walk up, and they would start saying, you're the preacher, huh? How did you know that? Dude, I don't even know you, you know? But everybody knew that when I got there. I think the supervisor told everybody, but, but that's okay too. But you know, when you see that, they, they have that. Marsh and me went to a church one time. I don't remember where it was at. We was visiting. Yeah, we, it was in Michigan. But we was up in this place in Michigan. We walked in, and we didn't know nobody in this church. And we walked in there, and they go, 
You're a pastor, aren't you? You know, to us. Yeah. How do you know that? I've never been here before. I don't know anybody here. Oh, just by the way you look. <laughs> I didn't know how to take that, really. I just didn't know how to take that. I thought, do I look funny? You know, uh, most people say I don't look like a pastor, and I'm okay with that. But when they say I look like one, I get a little nervous. But, <laughs> but when we look at that, it's amazing because that virtue will shine. That virtue will shine. And all people have to see is that coming out of you. And to me, it becomes exciting from that. But the fruit of the Spirit there opens our heart and our minds to show the, produ the produce of the, of the Spirit within our lives. We show that produce. And to me, that's an exciting thing because that produce does one desire, and that's to build within us a perfect man. That's its longing. The Holy Spirit wants to make you a good man, a perfect man, or a good woman, perfect woman. That's his desire. Because when we can walk that way, then we'll walk being the, the way God desires us to be. And there's nothing more precious than that. We have to understand something else. This fruit is not something we just do on our own. This isn't something we just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to walk in goodness today. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. If you're going to walk in goodness, you better be building a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You better be working into that area. Because what we realize is that the qualities that we walk in are only given to us by the Spirit. Don't miss that. I long to walk in all these. I long for it. But in order for me to walk into these, I daily have to be meeting with the Spirit. Daily, when I get up, talking with Him, sharing with Him, asking Him to guide me, direct me. I never read my scriptures without asking the Holy Spirit to teach me. Because He's the one that guides Every time I get, per, start to prepare my message for Sunday, I ask him for guidance. Every Sunday morning, I ask him, give me the ability to preach this thing because I know on my own I can't do it. I can't. I, I told Marshall one day, because I always listen, when I get home and put my video together, I always listen to it before I put it online. I want to <laughs> see how bad I sounded. But I told her last week, I thought, man, I think I'm getting a little better. <laughs> I said, sometimes I look at that and I thought, hey, who is that guy? I didn't know. Man, he's pretty good. <laughs> no, I'm kidding there. But, you know, when you look at that, we realize that we have to have the spirit with us or, or we will never find it. And I want to prove this. Now, watch what Paul says here in Romans 15. Now, pay attention to this. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye are that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to, to admonish one another. Now pay attention here to the word full. That's the one we're after in this scripture. Full of goodness. Now watch this, because note how this is applied now with, with where John's gospel says this in 21.11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fish, 150, the, uh, three, and for all there were so many yet was nothing that broken. I love this. I, I, I One time in my, this is the way this melon works. I thought, how heavy was that net? 153 fish. That's a lot of fish. But it says Simon went, nobody else, just Simon. And I, man, I have a lot of respect for old Simon right here. This is a man right here. 153 fish. Now do the math on that. I don't know what a large fish would weigh from that sea. Let's just go with three pounds. Do the math. Man, you're talking almost 500 pounds in that net, pulling it out of water, dead weight. And that man pulled it to shore by himself. That's a man. That is a man. But that's an amazing thing. But note the word full. Now compare them. Full is the same Greek word that Paul used. Same one. Now pay attention here. Paul says that we are to be filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. We're, we're filled. Now, this is the same thing that Peter says. He's full of great fish. What we see here, there is a reality within this statement because what we realize is that now there is something tangible to our, our fullness that Paul's talking about. There's a tangibleness that says, I have something that you can see within my life that that's a reality. It's real. This is what I gained from what Paul said right there. 
I can have this because Peter, by, or by John, using that same word, it's tangible. It's evidence. It's proof that this is a reality. So apparently that excited me way more than it excited you. That excited me because now I see the joy and the reality of the Spirit working in my life. I can take that net and I can pull it in and I can pull all that virtue in because it's full. Can't be no more. It can't be no more. Just as Jesus filled that net, the Holy Spirit fills that one. That's exciting to me. That is exciting to me because now I can trust in Him in my walk. I can trust Him to bring me that thing that's tangible in my life that I can record, that I can see as evidence, the reality of Him working through me. Jesus tells us this in 1235 of Matthew. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasures bringeth forth evil things. There's our comparison. There's our comparison. This is what our full net will bring us. It's going to bring us, if it's full, good things. I like that. Now we see the blessings of grace, but we also see the judgment of the evil things. Sad state to fall into that judgment. But the question we have to ask is this. We've got to make this applicable. Can we actually walk that way? Is it even possible, and how do we do it? Now let's watch this, because I believe that we can. I believe that it's fully possible to walk in this way. I can prove this by looking at the man, Joseph. Joseph and his brothers had a wild relationship. Can you imagine your brother selling you into slavery? Now, back in the day, I could see mine doing that. I really could. Uh, with all honesty, I can stand here before God and say I could see that. But know what Joseph said in Genesis 50, 20. But as for you, you thought evil against me. That's what he's talking to his brothers. Uh, Jacob's dead. Now they're going to fight it out among themselves. But God meant it unto good. God showed grace. To bring this to pass, it is this day, to save much people alive. Joseph's basically saying that God gave me grace and I will return that grace unto you. Oh, that's goodness right there. That proves to me that we can live that way. We can live that way. Joseph was demonstrating to all that goodness was just not an idea. It's not just an idea. If I wake up in the morning and I get up and say, I'm going to be good today. I'm going to walk in goodness. That's right here. It's just an idea. It's a hope. Joseph lived that. He lived that because the Spirit was with Joseph. And because of this, he was filled with that goodness. And when we're filled with goodness, that character of the Spirit is going to be harvested in him. Now, I'm going to finish up here, but i got a lot to show you before we're done. But I'll go through this quick. How do we do this? How do we come to a place of goodness when we're led by the Spirit? How is it evident in our life? What is the outcome of it? And we'll start here. This will live with integrity. In Zechariah 8, 16. These are the things that ye shall do. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. This is an awesome scripture for this reason. If we're going to walk in goodness, it's just not here and here and here and here. It's everywhere. He said, all goodness, remember? All goodness. So when we look at this, we have to understand that this is done on the inside and outside. It's telling you that you better not be walking in hypocrisy. That's what it's stating. Understand now this. Read this close. It says, these things that ye shall do, speak ye ever man the truth to his neighbor. That's the outside. Okay? That's outward. Now watch. Execute judgment of truth and peace in your gates. That's inside you. That works within you. It's something that we do. The next thing here we see is generosity. Psalms 37, 26. He ever merciful and leadeth, and his seed is blessed. We see now generosity comes. We're to give that generosity out. A person harvesting goodness is going to be able to walk seeking God. But in the process of seeking God, he's going to follow his commands, and he's going to live to that standard. We understand that, and, and it's a mighty thing because of, of and I don't, oh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'm good. 
So we look in generosity and we give that to, to the world. And I think when you get to generosity, this goes back to what we seen last week with kindness a little. Three, they will desire only righteous living. I like this one. First Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things. Hold fast. Hold fast to that which is good. The world can be going nuts around us just like it is. But hold to that which is good. Hold to that which is as good to God's standards, living up to his righteousness. Fourth thing is this, they will live with justice. Micah 6, 8, he hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee. I like that, don't you? I mean, right there, it's made clear. God's going to tell us what to do. He's going to tell us what is good, and then he's going to tell us how to do it. But to do justly and to live mercy, or love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God pretty cut and dry we're going to walk in goodness of the spirit and we're going to walk harvesting that fruit it'll be in this place fifth thing is this they will walk in sincerity paul wrote in first corinthians 5 8 therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven neither with the leaven of the malice and wickedness but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth that's good that's good he's talking to us to not be conceited but to be fair in our dealings, be righteous, be sincere in what you do, sincere from the word. What we understand through this is an amazing thing. We make the choice now of how we will walk. We just can't lump this with kindness. It doesn't work. Like many, I, I'm not kidding you. I, I've looked at almost every opportunity of commentaries that I have, and I got a bunch, but almost 90% of them, Maybe even 95% of them lumped these two together and they never even hardly even met goodness. And I thought, man, what a pity because there's so much to this. We have to make a choice to how we're going to walk. We can't walk with the wrong heart. If we walk with the wrong heart, we're going to fail. We're going to fail and we're just going to be some kind of sham of a Christian. That's not how I want to be. I want to walk in reality. I want to walk in reality of the word. So we ask ourselves, are we walking in the reality of goodness? Acts of kindness, then, at that point, becomes something that's very special. It means a whole lot more by that act of kindness if we're doing it with goodness. I'm doing it with the right opportunity. If I see some guy on the street and I give him $100, do I do that just to make myself feel good? Or is that just a virtue that's in me because I would do it to the next guy down the street as well? It's how we look at it. It's how we walk. It's how we perceive what's going on in my life, how the Spirit's working and moving. We must come to that place in our life. The more I get through this series, the more I'm humbled because I see where I need to improve in my life. I need to allow the Spirit to work in such a great way. I hope that's what it is for you. These aren't messages that are meant to go in one ear and out the other. They're meant to stop in the middle and drop down about a foot. Change our hearts. Change our hearts. Because then it makes all the difference in the world. Father, we thank you for the love of your son. Father, we know he's the one that allows us to walk in the spirit. He's the one that gives us the opportunity.